I'm really excited today about this new collaboration between the Graduate Writing Lab and the Yale Broadcast Studio. I don't know if you know, but the Yale Broadcast Studio has its professional hands in everything at Yale. Uh, the biggest production that they do, I think, graduation, would you say, Guy? Like the, the all the recordings and the, the speeches by the president, all that stuff. And they're actually the ones that film the final three minute thesis competition, finalist vid event itself and the videos and offer that to the Yale Alumni Association that who loves to leverage them as like, look at the amazing work that, that their students are doing. So if, if that's right too, right? Guy on that line. Yep, nope, nope, I do okay. the three MTs. There you go. So let me give you a brief introduction to Guy Ortoliva. Uh, Guy has worked in the broadcast studio for several years and both records and does video editing. Before that, he worked on many television shows like Inside Edition and Hard Copy, documentaries, commercials, and corporate training videos. He has a JD, but more importantly, he has 30 years of experience in communicating with video. Today, he's going to help you improve your presentations with a toolkit of communication and technical tips. Um, the way that things are gonna go is Guy is gonna offer you a mix of uh, video and um, slides and things like that. Uh, closed captioning is enabled. And at the end, we're gonna have about 15 minutes of just open Q&A. For that portion, I'll ask you to still mute it because this is a large crowd. You'll chat your questions into the chat box and I will kind of try to pick out ones that I see. For any unanswered questions, I will save the chat, send that over to Guy and we'll be sure to follow up with all the questions that you know were unanswered um, in, the, in an email. And then at the very end, I'm gonna send a link in the chat for an evaluation survey. This is a new workshop. It's a new thing that we're doing. We'd love to hear your feedback, what worked, uh, what could be improved and what could you see in the future that you know we haven't addressed. I'm also going to advertise the body language workshop presenting engagingly online that we'll be offering this Friday at four o'clock. So feel free to check that out too and register for it and I'll confirm you soon enough. So with that, I will mute myself and let Guy take it away. Thank you so much for everyone for being here. Thank you, Julia. That was, that was great. <laughs> um, a long time ago, I used to have a production studio, a production uh, company out in California, uh, in Sacramento. And we covered a lot of Northern California and we got calls every week from different magazine shows, tabloid shows and stuff like that to run around and shoot the interviews and get all the footage and material. Um, what we had to learn very quickly was how to do something that looked like real television, but very quickly. Uh, we met the producer at the airport, picked them up, went to who knows where, offices, prisons, all kinds of places. We had to work quickly and it had to look just like television. Because if some editor in New York or Los Angeles started looking at the footage saying, that doesn't look so good, we don't need to call them anymore. After a few months, you don't need. So we had to learn a bunch of really quick techniques that let you do a decent job and come across very well on video. Many of those really apply to what you all are doing now with your online presentations. Uh, what, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is start out with a uh, short video with a couple of my colleagues. These are some videos we had done several years ago when we were teaching people how to do their own videos. Um, but it will give you, while not everything is 100% applicable, um, you'll see a lot that you can identify with. So these videos will give you some of the terminology that we're going to use as I get into um, the rest of my presentation. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about location shooting. Most of your interview subjects are going to be short on time, so scheduling is always going to be a challenge. Shooting your subject in his or her office is a good solution to this problem. It may be more practical to use their office rather than trying to schedule a public or shared space. Let's look at an example of this. Consider placing your subject seated in front of a bookcase or maybe have them sit behind your desk. Use your judgment, but there are three things we'd like to recommend you keep in mind while choosing a location. Avoid shooting in front of a blank wall. Don't shoot in front of a window with light coming in because your subject may appear as a silhouette. Also, be sure to close all windows to reduce the noise coming in from outside. If you can keep these things in mind, 
you'll have gone a long way towards solving some of the problems that location shooting can bring. Hi, I'm Craig Tomlin. I'm here to talk to you about framing and shot composition. Sometimes a recorded video just doesn't look right. This is usually due to a badly composed or framed shot. There are a number of shot selections you can make when framing your subject for an interview. For example, the extreme close-up, medium, long shot, and wide shot, just to name a few. For the majority of video interviews, we recommend what is known as a medium close-up. This shows the head and shoulders of the subject. First, make sure you give your subject enough headroom or your framing will look cramped. This shot selection will also allow you to insert a lower third graphic to identify your subject. We'll get into lower thirds later. It is also very important to keep the lens of the camera at the same height as the eyes of your subject. If your camera is higher, shooting down, your subject may have a smaller, more submissive presence in the frame, like this. Conversely, if the lens is too low, your subject will exhibit a more imposing, intimidating disposition, like this. These are useful practices in the field of investigative journalism, but are not appropriate for most of the videos you may be producing. You also need to think about where you want to place your subject in the frame. For interviews, we recommend placing your subject according to the rule of thirds. Imagine your screen has a grid over it like this. You should place your subject on one of the spots where the lines intersect, here for example. You are going to have to decide whether you want your subject looking off camera or looking directly into the lens. Looking directly into the lens is only recommended when the subject is speaking directly to the viewer, like I'm doing right now, or to elicit an emotional response. For all other circumstances, we recommend having your subject appear as if they are speaking with an interviewer off camera, as I'm doing now. Have the interviewer position themselves as close to the lens as possible to maintain a sight line. We hope some of these tips are useful on your next shoot. There's one key point uh, on that, those videos when we talk about the rule of thirds. Back then, almost all of the interviews and recordings we were doing, you had a person off to the side of the camera. And so when you do that, you want to leave a little bit more space on the direction that they're looking. Uh, for what you're doing now, unless you really want to be creative, uh, the rule of six should mean that you're in the middle. There should be a line going along right in here and you're pretty much in the center of the picture, pretty much like what I am now. So if you do this, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on now with the uh, slides. Bear with me. And uh, Don Hewitt, who was the executive producer of uh, 60 Minutes, when asked what made 60 Minutes such a success, he would simply say, tell me a story. And ultimately, that's what you are doing. You are telling a story to the people that are watching your online presentation. You have to have a beginning where you're getting the people's attention. You have to have a middle where you develop it. And you have to have an end with a conclusion, just like telling your kids a bedtime story. Beginning, middle, and end, you're telling a story. You want to try and get people's attention pretty much in those first 15 seconds and give them a reason for them to continue uh, paying attention to you. For your last 15 seconds, which is what people pretty much will remember, try and memorize that. Really, really know your conclusion so that at the end, you're drilling people right there. Um, okay, uh, you wanna prep when you're, when you're preparing your story, uh, prep, but have yourself a one sentence objective. That's really important. A real need to know from nice to know, but a one sentence objection, objective of what your story is. Understand your target audience 
And you want to have what we call a treatment. A treatment is basically a prose version of an outline. One thing to really, really understand is people cannot listen to you intently and also pay attention to your visuals. It has to be one or the other. There's a balance that you have to strike here between the story that you're telling and the visuals that you're using to amplify it or to support it. If you've got really complex visuals, they're not going to be listening to you. And if they're really paying attention to your voice, they're not going to be concentrating on the visual. So you have to find that balance. Um, location issues are some of the things that we're going to talk about later. And that has to do with how you can find a place around your house or wherever you're going to be uh, so you can present yourself well. And presenting yourself well is going to include clothes. There's certain clothes that will make you look a little bit better and some clothes that really could become a problem. But for you to really understand how that works, you're going to have to understand how cameras work. And we're going to get into that too. And I'm advancing my slide. <laughs> I'm going to do it the old way. Okay. Uh, we call the video about the how to. Eye level is very important. Um, how many of us have seen the low angle camera looking up your nose or the camera that's way up above the, 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 the computer that's looking down? You really want to have that eye contact. Um, that is very, very important. And you have to be able to see the eyes. Uh, for the slides that you're doing, will you be in the frame with the slide or are you going to be side to side? Uh, if you're going to be in the frame, up in the corner, make sure you leave yourself a little room in your slides. Um, the best type of framing that we like to see is either a close up or a medium shot like what I have now. Um, some of the videos that I've seen that have come in where we have to edit them, they're showing a, almost their whole body and it's unnecessary. You really are concentrating on the story. You are the story, what you're saying. So don't make yourself so small in the picture that people can't really see you. Um, the primary visual is you and your body language. So you may have graphics and other things, but ultimately people like to see other people. And so make sure that you are presenting yourself well and the visuals are supporting you. Uh, and speaking of visuals, make sure that you do your due diligence on the copyright. Um, Wikimedia Commons is a good place to get images, but um, don't find yourself in trouble because you didn't clear some of the images. And okay. So what you will hear is also really important. Um, Really good audio is essential for doing an online presentation. If you've got a mediocre picture, but great audio, it's a pass. But if you've got a pristine image, but the sound is breaking up or people can't hear you, you lost. That's it. It's, it's not going to work. So remember, there's picture and sound. Don't underplay the, the value of the sound. And a microphone is really as good as the distance it is from you. Um, I have a microphone here. Um, it's not too far away from me. It's picking up sound and we'll go into how that works. But even an iPhone, because a lot of people have been recording themselves for videos, they record themselves on an iPhone. Even an iPhone, well, iPhone can sound great if it's close enough. And even though we're talking about hearing, remember, can the people see your eyes? Because whether people can see your eyes should give you some kind of a guide on the type of framing you're going to do. Uh, and again, that should be a clue if you're using your iPhone and you put it so far away, you can't see the eyes. It's also telling you you probably can't hear it either. So better audio uh, is essential. Uh, some people are using headsets now. Uh, earbuds are good because you have the little microphone here or you have a cardioid microphone. Here is a cardioid microphone. Here's through here. So microphone and the proximity to you, it's what gives you the good sound, like the earbud or the headset is picking up the sound that's close to the sound source. If you're using an iPhone, again, no more than three or four feet away. 
going back to the eye level, your eyes should be at the same level as the camera. Seriously. This is one of the real takeaways you need to get from this presentation here. Your eyes are the most important part of your message so that people have to be able to see them and you should be making eye contact with your um, viewers through the camera. Um, if you are going to do some lighting in your house or wherever you're doing your presentation, rule of thumb is that you, the subject, should be twice as bright as the background. This creates kind of a separation. I'm kind of cheating here because I've got um, you know some, some real lights that are helping me out. Uh, the key light, which is the primary light, primary light. Now, what, what is the primary light in our, in our lives? It's the sun. So our DNA has been programmed to see light from one primary source. And that's going to be the key light. So we're going to get into where the lights go, but you want to have one dominant light source if you can, or make it so even between two lights that you are um, not dark on one side. Um, if you're lost in the frame, and again, and this is uh, why you shouldn't have too wide a shot. If you're lost in the frame, your message is gonna be possibly lost too. There, it actually clicked when I hit the keyboard this time. Um, video is um, resolution. Now, we, we don't have back the old square type TVs. We're now shooting in widescreen. Your recording should be in resolution of 1920 by 1080, um, 30 frames a second if you're using your iPhone, 29.97 um, to be exact. Uh, if you're using Zoom, Zoom records at 25 frames a second. It's roughly the same. Um, but 1920 by 1080, which is your full HD or high definition, that's, that's the goal. You should strive for that. Uh, you want to test out a camera position with backgrounds. I know a lot of people just pick up their laptop and put it on with the with the camera and go around their house and find a place that makes them look good, whether it's daylight coming in, their own light source, some lights overhead, uh, pleasing backgrounds. But move around, find a place that works. And um, windows can help your image and they can hurt you too. Um, you don't wanna have bright lights behind you. You may have to bring some lights in or lights being lights that you have around the house, um, desk lamps and things like that. Uh, ambient sound, uh, whenever we record in any place, we'll go into the room and stand there just for a minute and be quiet. Do you hear air handling? Is the furnace making noise? Uh, is the refrigerator going on <laughs> making noise? You have to think about ambient noise and maybe that's a reason that you move to a different place. One of the things that you can do and to minimize ambient noise is to not have many large flat surfaces, chairs, things like that can break it up, but um, big flat surfaces anywhere in the room will tend to reflect sound as a large enough sound wave that it could become an issue for you. Okay, here's the test. What's the first thing that you see? Is eyes. I'll be willing to bet that the first thing that you see are John Kerry's eyes. Your eyes are gonna be drawn to it. Um, the second thing that your eyes will probably be drawn to is the light behind him. And then when you really get bored, you'll start looking at the books over his shoulder. Now, this is an example. I do shoots with John Kerry. You need something quick to send off to someplace. So we'll run over there and they'll say, okay, well, you can use the library. And I have a few minutes to set up. Um, this is essentially the goal of what you're looking for for your presentations. Nice medium shot. His face is lit. You can see his eyes. He's separated because television is a flat two-dimensional medium. I mean, you, you have to create the illusion of depth. So the light that's on his shoulder to separate him and on his hair that separates him from the background is actually a light. It's not natural. <laughs> it's not really coming from the window. I have a light there shining. But you'll notice his other shoulder is not separated at all from the bookcase. Um, sometimes you have compromises. Also, he's not lit really twice as bright as the background. The bookcase really should be about half as bright as John is. 
And that way you wouldn't be looking at all the book titles to see what they are and see what are in the library there. But this is the type of framing. This is a relatively pleasant type of shot. But understand that the first thing that you're going to see are people's eyes. That's what you're going to look for. We just as an aside, we had a little pet lizard. My son had a pet lizard. Every time you walk around by that thing, the lizard will look you right in the eye. So I think it's all the way back in our DNA, but it's natural for us to seek out other human eyes. And that's what we look for. So here's the lighting diagram, which is as simple as you can get. And this is what we used to do for all our TV magazine shows. You want to put your key light next to the lens. And what I always do is I put my key light. Here's the lens. I'll put the key light one foot over and one foot above the lens. That's my starting point. I may move it out a little bit more to create more shadow, but right as a starting point, a little bit off to the side and a little bit above the lens, uh, the lens of the camera is a good starting point for your key light. Then if you can get away with a second light to create some separation to make you pop out of the frame, um, you put one on the opposite side towards the back. Now, this girl also be an overhead light. Um, that will work just as well. And that's what I do at my house. My second light is really just an overhead light that's casting a little light on my shoulder and my head, and it makes me pop out of the frame. Uh, a fellow named Jeff Carlson did a bunch of these little images of um, do's and don'ts. And um, here I'll go through images that you've probably seen many times on Zoom meetings. First, you have the shot where there's not enough headroom. And then you get the shot where there's a lot of strong backlight. Backlight can really, really, really affect your image. Uh, as you're gonna see later, cameras can't handle both a person in the foreground and a bright light coming from the back. It will both throw off the focus and it will also cause the person to be kind of silhouetted. Um, you can see the mug shot. My favorite shot is the monster descending. Um, how many of you have seen really scary movies? I, the movie Alien comes to mind. Um, remember the scene when uh, Harry D uh, Dean Stanton character is looking for the cat and he's out there and it's all scary. And you just know that there's a monster. The alien is going to come down from up above and get him. How do you know? Well, there's a lot of camera techniques that filmmakers have used for 100 years to telegraph what's about to happen, to create suspense. And one of the most obvious ones is you create a space where you expect a bad thing to happen from. If you have a person looking to one way and there's a lot of space over their shoulder, well, that's where the bad guy is going to come in. And the same thing as you have a monster descending when you have a lot of headroom over your head. The other one, busy backgrounds. When you're going around your house looking for a place to record yourself, look at yourself on the camera. You know, use the zoom preference uh, setting so that you can see the video and see what it actually looks like. Is it going to be distracting? So in the bottom right, that's a good balance of framing, not too busy a background, and it looks halfway decent. So how does a camera see? Kind of like our eyes. We have an iris in our eyes and the, we adjust for the amount of light coming in. Our eyes are very good at that. Cameras are not so good. They're not nearly as robust as the human eye, but they still have an iris and it adjusts for the light. With most of the technology you're, you're using, it's doing it automatically and it's averaging. So in other words, if you have a scene, the camera is looking at it and trying to come up with a balance of light so that the human face is roughly 70% of brightness. From a zero to 100, um, the face is gonna be about 70%. That's essentially what a camera is trying to do in, in these circumstances. So if you have a lot of bright light coming in behind, just like your eyes would squint, the camera is going to close down. And so now the exposure on the face is going to be a lot less. 
It, the worst is when you have somebody with a bright light behind them and they move side to side and you watch. You can watch the camera open up. Now you see their face very clearly and then they move to another position and it averages the light and it closes down. Open, close. It's, well, averaging isn't always good because, for example, if somebody's got their head in an oven and their feet in a refrigerator, you can say, well, on average, they're comfortable. So averaging isn't always a great thing, but unfortunately, that's what these cameras do. And so you have to adjust for that. And we're going to also talk about that when we get into the clothing. And not all light is the same. Um, there are times that you will turn on a light and your face is redder than it should be, or there, everything is cold and blue. And that's because if you remember back in high school when you learned about the electromagnetic spectrum, we see light in a narrow band there. And at the low end of the spectrum, the light is reddish and it gets bluer and towards violet as the other end, at the other end. So incandescent bulbs, you know, the ones that we've been using for so long and that we've been told use too much energy are way at the low end of the spectrum. And spectrum is uh, for lighting is measured in what we call Kelvins. So you might have the incandescent light is about uh, 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Television professional lights are at 3,200 degrees. It's very, that's it. That's the, that's the temperature. Daylight is much closer to 4,600, 5,000. And I'll Screaming blue sky goes way up from there. So you have red and blue lights. Um, if you've replaced your bulbs with um, LED lights, uh, which many of us have, you'll look on the box and most of them will have either warm or daylight. It's always good to have a few daylight bulbs, even if you don't plan to use them generally for lighting your house, because if you have a lot of daylight coming in and you want to put a light on to also give yourself some extra lighting on your face, you wanna make sure that you're not mixing red light with blue light. You wanna have both the LED light would be blue or daylight mixing with the daylight coming in. So imagine having a window like this, this fellow in the top left, He's got a wonderful setup for recording. He's got his uh, little camera on a tripod. He's got wonderful, warm daylight coming in. I'm sure he's illuminated great. He's even got a little script underneath the lens there. He's going to look great during the daytime. The camera is going to adjust for that daylight color temperature. And I'm sure he just looks great. And the same thing with the woman on the bottom left there. Uh, she's got a desk lamp. Maybe she's got a nice little blue LED light in there to balance out the daylight coming in and the light that she's using to eliminate her face. Uh, same thing when it gets dark out. Well, with everybody being online, marketers have come up with lights that you can put right on your laptop and that's enter the ring light. Uh, everybody buys the ring lights and that's not the best place to put it right there, because if you look at the lower right, uh, the young lady there is beautifully lit, but if you look close at her eyes, you see the ring light and doesn't really look flattering when people start looking in your eyes and they see that pattern. So how can we light things a little bit better? Well, you can still use the ring light, but move it off to the side so that it's not reflecting directly in your eyes. Uh, you'll notice that uh, these are a couple of uh, products that are for sale. Uh, it comes on a stand, so you can raise it and lower it so it's at the right height uh, away from your uh, the lens of your camera. And they come for, uh, with little gels that you can put on it. Um, the, the white one is probably to soften it. And the orange is to change it from daylight to room light, so incandescent. So for example, if let's say you do have a bunch of incandescent lights around the house and you put this thing on, well, it'll be throwing a blue light on you and you wouldn't like that. So you'd put the orange gel to take the blue back down to the same color temperature as your incandescent lights. Uh, and the same thing, you might have other colors that you can add to it. Um, there's my boss on the bottom right. Um, he's put two lights on his um, computer on either side. So he opts for the nice balanced light where you have equal light coming in from the sides, 
and it's also not reflecting off his glasses. So this is a way that he can illuminate his face and look great and not have all these bright lights reflecting in his eyes. All right, so let's talk about audio. Um, microphone essentially is taking your sound waves, turning it into electronic signal, and that's what goes out. Um, the best type of microphone for you to be using is one that is directional or what we call cardioid. Cardioid because the pattern that you see on the, the top right there is like an inverted heart. So it's picking up sound in the direction it's pointed and it's canceling out the sound from behind. Um, that way it's not picking up all the roomy. You know, you've heard of Zoom things where everything sounds very roomy. Well, this is a way to, to defeat that. If you get yourself a um, cardioid microphone like this, this type of microphone, unlike the one in that picture, the top picture there, is picking up the sound from here. So this is sitting on your desk and this is where the element is facing, just like the microphones there. And you can set it for picking up sound in all directions or in the second pattern there, cardioid. And cardioid is the one you should be using. You could also have stereo, which is that pattern in the bottom right. We can talk about that, but most of you really should be using the cardioid or directional pattern. Uh, again, here's this microphone. You'll take a look at the, in the middle picture. Um, there, are, Those are the settings that you can put on it. And uh, the first one is your um, stereo, then omnidirectional, and then click it to um, cardioid. Uh, the other one, the, the figure eight, is good if you've got somebody on either side of it. It picks up the sound in both directions. So a lot of your aftermarket microphones, if you want to get something better than your computer uh, microphone and a little bit better than the headsets and stuff, this is the type of thing you can get. But if the sound coming out of that microphone is too high, it's going to be distorted. We're in the digital world now. In the analog world, you could have a nice, robust sound, and it was really great. Unfortunately, now in the digital world, you hit zero, and it starts to distort. So you'll notice that the gain button on there, I've set to just below 50%. That would be a good place to start. So if you buy one of these microphones, uh, there's probably going to be a gain knob on it. You want to start low and then go to your preferences um, on your Zoom and test the microphone. What you want is good sound without it sounding distorted and it hurting your ears. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, um, simple tips. Note your environment. Maybe we talked about that. It sounds obvious, but make sure you turn off your cell phone alerts and your email alerts and all of those. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've been in the middle of something really dramatic and unfortunately something happens. Um, avoid rustling papers, uh, especially if you've got a microphone on the table, it will pick up that sound and it will be distracting. You won't notice it, but the people on the other end will notice it. And again, uh, look around your room, you know, you've identified a room or in your house or a place that is going to work visually. Look around and see if you can break up any of these big flat surfaces that might reflect sound. And the thing that you really need to think about is behind you. It's actually the sound that bounces off the wall behind you that comes into the microphone. That's going to be your worst enemy. That's going to muddy the sound. Because remember the microphone here, this microphone is pointed towards me, any sound that hits that wall and comes this way is going to arrive here just a little bit after my voice did, and it's going to make it sound kind of muddy. Clothing. Um, solid colors. Pastels are okay. Um, you know, off-whites, grays, blues, browns. That will look very good on television because it's going to, remember the camera, averages light. So if you have you know, a really, really dark shirt and the bright light, the face is going to kind of bloom. The same token is if you have a bright white shirt and the light hits it. Well, it's the iris is going to average down because there's a lot of light coming back between the white shirt and your face. The camera says, gee, that seems pretty bright. We ought to 
closed down and now your face is a little bit darker. So you want to think about avoiding um, blacks and whites if you can or high contrast colors. Television cameras are not nearly as robust as our eyes and they're going to have trouble with it. Uh, avoid pinstripes, thin pinstriped herringbone. Um, that will make it look like you have worms crawling up your shirt. Uh, we call it a moire pattern. It happens because you get a television picture because there's electrons scanning back and forth many times a second. And that's how you get your image. And these poor electrons are just having a lot of trouble. When there's a lot of vertical patterns, it's just too much for them. So give the electrons a break. Don't wear thin pinstripes or herring bones and stuff like that. And you'll look a lot better. Uh, and again, avoid combinations that are going to create um, high contrast because that's just one more thing the camera is going to have to wrestle with. Because remember, it's your face. Your face is the story. And you want to make sure that your face is well illuminated and it's not being detracted by the camera iris having to adjust for all of the other things. Jewelry, uh, jingle jewelry especially, you may not notice it but it could be making noise on the microphone and the people on the other hand, other end may be too polite to mention it, but the fact is it's distracting from your message. Darker colors are slimming, um, but again, avoid black if you can. PowerPoints, um, I know you're gonna be using some visuals. The PowerPoints also should be 1920 by 1080 widescreen. Um, that's the 16 by nine aspect ratio. Do not use the default PowerPoint 4x3 or the white backgrounds with black text. Uh, it's great for text that you read in a book, but it's just not good for television. It's too much light coming back for the eyes, even. Um, best to use the dark background, white or light text. Um, you have to think about the visibility and the resolution and avoid clutter because the more clutter you put in an image, the more people are gonna to have to struggle to see it and the less they're going to be listening to you. Again, consider your copyright. Um, so the PowerPoint camera, this is just to give you an idea. Back in the old days, about a year ago, when we would do presentations, not necessarily online, but in rooms, um, this idea of the white slides with black text really comes and bites people. Um, you can expose for the person, and the slides are unreasonable, unreadable, or you can ex expose the, the iris on the camera for the slides and the people are too dark. So this is one of the reasons that you really wanna think about not using an all white slide. Uh, it's it's gonna be a problem all around. Um, and But you are gonna have images, you can crop the images and put them up um, like this on a background. So preparing your story, you're going to make sure you determine the need to know from the nice to know. The visuals are there to amplify your story. You are the story, what you're telling them. The graphics in them should amplify and not take away from it. Um, if, are you going to be in the frame with the slide? Plan for space. Um, best is to be seen, I, I find, the best is to be seen on camera first, then you go to your slide, and then back to you. Uh, many times I've seen people leave their slide up long past the time that everybody's gotten all the information they need from it, but the slide is still there and they're this tiny little postage stamp up in the corner talking to them and their message is lost. Again, it's your eyes, it's your face, it's your presentation. Make sure that your visuals is not detract, are not detracting from you. Trim out the unwanted portions, bring your material to life. And give yourself time to tell a story without having to rush through it. Uh, legal issues. <laughs> you know, saying, um, do it right, sleep at night. Um, don't borrow too many things that you're going to get in trouble for. Um, I'm also the person that puts stuff up on YouTube and has to answer to the music that people use that they really didn't have permission to use. Um, you can also go to the Yale Office of General Counsel, get your release forms. Uh, they also can give you some guidance on what is fair use. They have a, a document called a fair use uh, analysis tool. Basically, fair use is a four-point balancing test to determine whether you can use something. 
And so keep in mind, this is one of the other takeaways besides the eyes, is that people can only concentrate on what you are saying or what you're showing them, but not necessarily equally at the same time. So if you've got something really compelling to say, don't have it be distracted by the visual. And if the visuals have some really complex information, make sure that you are giving people time for them to shift from you and really look at the visual. The visual on the screen has to be able to be seen sometimes on a small screen. So even though we recorded things in 1920 by 1080, big HD, high definition, it may go out as 1280 by 720, or people may be looking at it on their um, iPad or their phone. So think about that when you're choosing what t details to put into your PowerPoint and how you're framing yourself. Again, you want people to see your face. The visuals support your important words. Your voice reinforces the visuals or calls attention to a detail. But above all, you're telling a story. So make sure that the story gets people's attention right at the beginning. You're able to hold it and you conclude so that they feel really good about your presentation and you're a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. That was amazing. Um, just, I found it so, so enlightening, literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, I couldn't resist. Um, we have some questions already in the chat, so I'll start with those. I also have two questions that we got before the workshop um, in our registration form. So if you don't mind, we'll move to the uh, Q&A portion um, of the this wonderful event. So quick question. I I've been thinking about this and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, lighter and darker skin tone. So how skin tone plays into all of the amazing um, suggestions that you have for like what to wear, how to think about light and, and background. I, I wonder like if there's any like kind of, you know, uh, advice you might advice you might have for that. Just remember that the camera is averaging light. It's going to make anybody's skin tone look great as long as it doesn't have to fight against a bad clothing choice or a bad background. So um, I, I remember one interview where we had a Nigerian doctor in his white lab coat standing in front of x-ray machine. So if you wanna see a silhouette, that was a, that was a very challenging situation. So you don't want to have your, your camera will expose for your face perfectly well. So try and match your complexion with your clothing and your background. So don't have a, a bright window behind you, no matter what complexion you have. And if you have a darker complexion, make sure that your clothing choice isn't going to cause isn't going to cause the average of that camera's light to be so much that it diminishes. You, your facial recognition, how well we see your face. So just look at yourself, look at the background, look at your clothing choice and kind of realize that the camera is going to average the amount of light. So you should also anticipate that, best I can say. Thank you so much. I think that's a, these types of questions we have as we all prepare for interviews or, you know, like uh, recordings, and then we don't know who to ask. Um, so that's super helpful. Um, so I'm going to go to Dana and um, Celine's question in the chat. And Dana asked, um, since the three minute thesis videos for our online, uh, you know, competition this year need to use a plain white background. Those are the rules. Um, any tips for how to avoid the shadows or other problems discussed in the video? And then Celine asked kind of a follow-up question, why do you advise against a neutral plane white wall? I do think that that um, the mugshot thing comes to mind. I don't know if that's related, but if yeah. you wanted to do those two. Um, I think if you're going to be forced to using a plain white wall, which I can understand in, in a competition, maybe that's reasoning. What you don't want to have is the shadow distracting people. So your light is going to have to be a little higher so that it, and you have to be farther away from the wall so that the shadow, basic physics, if the light is over here, the shadow is gonna be, you know, following on a straight angle. 
So you want to position the light so that the shadow falls far enough below so that you don't see it on the wall behind you. So if you have a plain white wall, get yourself five or six or more feet away from it if you can. And then that way, any light that you use, which is a little higher, will drop down and it'll be out of sight. So the main thing is to illuminate yourself, create the separation from the wall that will allow you to, the camera will adjust because there's a lot more light on you rather than being reflected off the wall and any shadow will be down below. Thank you so much. Um, Cynthia asks, any tips for speakers with glasses, specifically how to avoid light being re reflected on glasses? The great question. Well, I'm wearing glasses. It's like choice of where to put the light. Um, if you have, again, it's just basic physics. The light comes here and there's the lens. It's going to be reflecting back. Um, what typically we would do is move a light a little bit to the side, a little bit higher. Um, and that way you can still see into the eyes um, without having the reflection going back right to the lens. So in this circumstance, we've moved the lights a little bit farther away from the, the, the camera. So this light is bouncing off of here and going there. And this light is bouncing off of this lens and going off that way. But they're not going back into the lens of the camera. Worst Sorry. case scenario, worst case scenario is you can always cheat. You can always tilt your glasses just a tiny bit. And then any reflected light will typically go down below the lens. Um, Dora asks, would you recommend a standing microphone more so than a wireless mic, perhaps? The wireless devices could give you a little bit of a telemarketer look. Would that look unprofessional for the three-minute thesis or I would say a job interview? Good question. Um, it depends on the skill of the person who's using it. I, I don't see any problem with a wireless microphone, you know, a clip-on microphone or the headset. Um, a clip-on microphone, if it's done properly, you don't have the cable hanging down, uh, I think is good. So what we always do is put put it behind in the shirt so that the, the, the clip is over here. You want to have a wireless microphone, like a lavalier microphone, six to eight inches away from your mouth. Um, that's going to give you a decent sound. That's okay. Um, I don't think it's a telemarketer, as long as it looks professional and the cable is tucked in behind your shirt. Um, or it comes out at the top if you're wearing a sweater or something like that. Um, I also don't think it's a problem if you have a handheld wireless microphone. Just remember that, you know, I use this remote, you're, when you're using a, a handheld wireless mic, uh, microphone like this, it's hearing, it's listening to you from the top, unlike these desk microphones. You want to hold it, you know, four or five inches away, not too close, because then we call that eating the microphone, and that's going to make distorted sound. Or if you have it way down here or wave it around, you're going to end up with poor audio. So if you're going to use a handheld stick microphone, as we call it, wireless even, um, do this. Um, on a stand, I, I, I just don't think a, a microphone on a stand is going to do you justice. Uh, that's going to plant you firmly in one place, and you're going to be doing your presentation around a fixed microphone. So whatever dynamic nature you might have is being defeated by the fact that you've got your feet firmly planted with a microphone now in your face. I don't think that's flattering at all. Um, so someone said, um, sorry, I'm catching up here. Um, would you recommend to stand while Zoom teaching to be more dynamic? And if so, what framing would you advise? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I think standing in general is more dynamic. You can have your, your better for your hands. You can, you know, just come across a little bit better. I would still go with a medium shot at widest. In other words, the kind of framing that I'm at now maybe a tiny bit wider because you're moving a little bit and, and unless somebody's moving the camera with you, um, I would not go so far as you down to waist level. I, I think you, you are gonna diminish your presence tremendously. So even if you're standing, make, again, you have to have the lens, no matter where you are, the lens of the camera has to be at eye level. 
So I'm assuming that you're going to do that. If you're sitting, you put it on a few books. If you're standing, make sure your lens is high enough. But the framing, I'd say, would be no more than a medium shot uh, if you want the best presentation of you. Thank you so much. So a couple of things about background for the slides. And so um, one question that we have is, you know, yes, we hear your advice about using slides with a dark background and white text, but the templates, including Yale's and the Porvu centers tend to have white backgrounds. What, what's going on there? And then also virtual backgrounds for you. Is that a good idea? I'm going to guess you're going to say no. Um, and then I have one more question too, and we'll, we'll try to get, get there. All right. Well, I, th I'm, I'm a fanatic about slides because I have to live with bad slides. Um, most of the videos we used to do were a person would be standing next to a video monitor and they've got their slides. And if they've got a white slide, we got to the point where we told them, you have to redo them um, because I can't have a big, bright, white light source next to a person trying to talk. I mean, which do you want me to do? <laughs> so... Um, if you're using the slides on computer, that's a personal choice. Um, if you're going to make any kind of presentation that people are gonna have to see at the back of a room, a dark background does work. Um, a white, bright light source with black text is gonna be more difficult to see, especially at a distance. If that's the template and that's what you're told you have to use, that's what you have to use. In my opinion, it's not as good as a darker background with white text because it's going to be more visible and your eyes aren't going to have to work so hard. They're not going to be squinting. Um, there was a second part of um, that question, and I, I forgive me if I... Oh, definitely. Got on, I got on my attention there. Um, but right, so it seems like this context is important, right? So if you're doing, if you want to do a template, but basically you don't need people to see you and you're just going through the slides like in a classroom, right? You're like, we're all going to look at this. That might not be an issue. But if you're at a conference presentation and you're talking about a slide or a series of slides, you need to think about that light balance because you need to be in the frame too. So it's about whether you are in or you're out, right? In terms of the considering the slide background. It's also a consideration of where is your audience. If your audience, if I'm looking at my laptop here and I have a bright white slide, I have to work harder and my eyes are gonna work harder than if I had a dark background, a darker background um, with white text. My, it's, it's just natural, you know, you know what it's like, if the bright light, your eyes squint a little bit. So the more reflective, and what is that white doing for you? Great on the printed paper, but what is that light, real white, really doing to enhance um, the readability of it? But there was and another. I, 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 yeah, the follow-up <laughs> question was about Zoom uh, backgrounds, like the virtual Zoom backgrounds. Background. Yeah, I'm using a virtual background right now. Uh, believe it or not, there, there there's no current behind a curtain behind there. It's, it's a green. Um, screen because we may have to superimpose the uh, background for any number of people that have to use this. The Zoom automatic background doesn't work so as well as using an actual green screen. So I have to use a virtual background where I do my Zoom things at home because I'm relegated to the basement. My wife sees patients on telemedicine upstairs and I'm down in the basement. So I have to use the uh, uh, the um, generated one. And every time I move my head, it doesn't look so good. If you can do a green screen where it's going to look much better, uh, I think that's great. Um, I think if you're going to use a virtual background, make sure it's not distracting from you. Uh, it should be something soft, something that you can maybe in Photoshop put slightly out of focus so that it's not drawing the viewer's eyes away from you. Don't give people something to distract themselves with. This is basically the rule that I'm suggesting. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up this session, because we're close to closing time, I'm going to, want to send the survey link in the chat and then also the body language workshop on Friday. But one more question that I have that I think is important to ask. You talked about these amazing light sources that you can buy, right? And like lights on stands and things like that. Is this the future of technology where like now everyone needs to be equipped with a laptop? We're all going to have to find 
resources and money to do this? Or can we, is it, are we okay to still get away with the minimal because not everyone can afford this fancy equipment or we'll be moving to like a borrowing system like the way we used to borrow books, though this will be, become more readily available. I'm just curious about that from a price point. Graduate students don't always have a lot of money as I recall. So, okay, okay, you know, okay. yeah. Um, I think if you can invest in maybe seven or eight dollars, I think that's what um, these LED daylight bulbs might cost. Um, for my setup at home, you're going to laugh, but I have a $2 metal work light. They come with on these little clamps and a little circle thing with a metal. And I've taken a, I think it was cost me $5 for a blue, uh, one of those LED screw in bulbs. Um, and that's my light that. And I have an overhead light that comes down and illuminates my shoulder. Uh, for my wife doing her telemedicine, we use the lights in our dining room. It's just the existing lights in the room. Uh, all I did is I, because there's a lot of daylight coming in, I unscrewed the incandescent bulbs and screwed in a couple of these um, LED lights that are daylight. That's it. So total cost for lighting both of our Zoom situations is under 20 bucks. <laughs> um, I, I, think you, I think you can go out and buy these things. I, I think it's certainly great. Get yourself a nice little LED light, maybe spend 20 bucks or 30 bucks or something like that. Um, have somebody give it to you for your birthday, you know, one on a stand or something like that. But it's just a matter of the placement of the light and make sure that it's not competing with a color temperature. Um, if, if everything in your house is that incandescent at the lower end of the spectrum, then use those bulbs. But it need not be anything complicated. It just needs to be in relatively the right place, a little bit off to the side and a little bit above where the lens of the camera is, and that lights you. And then if you can use some other light source to touch up your shoulders, you're 95% there. That's that's fantastic. I really appreciate that advice. You can get a little overwhelming with all the options that we have now. Um, they, just guys, don't have, they just don't have a bright window behind you that's fighting you. <laughs> that's the thing to keep in mind. Wonderful. So this uh, workshop was actually recorded. We'll follow up with um, answering other questions that came in the chat. Um, Guy, thank you so much for this amazing workshop. I'm going to go share it with my faculty spouse right now who needs to learn about that, you know, <laughs> full, full view of teaching classes. So I got things, I have knowledge to impart from you. Um, and I, we're so grateful for your time. I know you're a very busy person. If anyone, if everyone could just unmute themselves to say thank you and goodbye, we'd really appreciate it. And we will definitely follow up with you in a little bit. So thank you all. Great seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love awesome. your microphone. I have the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. This is excellent. Bye. I like about your lizard. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>